Hello class, this is Criminology, Chapter 3, Victims and Victimization. After this chapter, you should be able to analyze the victim's role in the crime process, discuss the greatest problems faced by crime victims, clarify the term cycle of violence, assess the ecology of victimization risk, categorize the most dominant victim characteristics, and compare and contrast the most important theories of victimization. As far as the victim's role, we'll talk about analyzing the victim's role in the crime process. Victims may play direct or indirect role in criminal incident. Victimology is studying the role victims play in criminal behavior. There are costs to victimization. The cost of victimization includes property losses, productivity losses, medical bills, and individual losses. These may take a significant toll because many expenses are associated with each crime. There are direct tangible costs such as attorney's fees, etc., and indirect intangible costs like psychological harm, harm to a marriage, etc. The cost of victimization can run into the hundreds of millions of dollars. A number of different methods have been developed to measure the cost of victimization. Catherine McAllister and Associates did a complex statistical analysis and the cost to a society of an average murder is almost $9 million. Considering that almost 16,000 Americans a year are the victims of murder, this crime alone costs the nation about $190 billion in losses each year. The cost is not only in the hundreds of billions of dollars, there's cost of goods, losses associated with injury, pain, and trauma, lost wages, and the cost to society of an average murder, again, just to remind you, is $9 billion. Then there are personal costs. More than two-thirds of serious violent crime victims experience socioeconomic problems because of victimization. They have post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, victim fear, Women tend to be more fearful, and victims are more fearful in general and change their behavior. And unfairly, victims take blame, and many experience blame from family, friends, and society. And that is especially prevalent for the crime of rape. Here's a discussion activity for you. Should victims of assault receive financial compensation for their pains suffered, including medical bills, psychological counseling, reimbursement for wages, etc.? What other costs would you expect if you were assaulted and unable to work for several months? And then who should pay for it? Then there are costs to the legal system itself. These legal costs don't mean attorney's fees. Here we mean by legal costs the cost to the legal system itself, in the sense that crime victims may be more likely to commit crimes themselves, and the cycle of violence begins. Victims of crime, especially victims who suffer childhood abuse, are much more likely to commit crimes themselves. There's also a social ecology of victimization. Victim surveys suggest that violent crime is slightly more likely to happen in open public areas during daytime or early evening hours. Rape and aggravated assault usually occur after 6 p.m. Two-thirds of rapes occur between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. And there is a seasonal variation. Household property crimes and serious violent victimization have higher rates in the summer. When all violent crimes are counted, fall has the highest rate of violence. Central parts of the city have higher rates of crime than suburban areas. As far as crime in schools, before and after school adult supervision is minimal. Schools bring together the most dangerous segment of population, teenage males. The location of the victim's household can also play a role. Homes in urban areas in the south and west are most vulnerable. Homeowners are less vulnerable than renters. Smaller households in less populated areas have lower victimization rates. Some of that crime rate decline is possibly due to population movement. Now let's talk about victim characteristics. Gender plays a role. 
Males are somewhat more likely to be victims of nonviolent crimes, such as sexual assault itself being excluded. Females are most likely to be victimized by someone they know, whereas males are most likely to be victimized by a stranger. Age also plays a role. Young, the young are more likely to be victimized than the elderly, and the elderly, however, are targeted for fraud and scams. In terms of social status, the poor are most likely to be victims of both violent and property crimes. The homeless suffer high rates of assault. As far as race and ethnicity, African Americans are significantly more likely to be victims of violent crime compared to European Americans. When it comes to marital status, those who have never married suffer higher rates of victimization compared to people who are married. Widows and widowers have the lowest victimization risk. As far as physical and mental traits, victims can have impulsivity, risk-taking, lack of self-control, low tolerance for frustration, or physical disabilities. Then there's the phenomenon of repeat victimization. Victims have a higher chance of being re-victimized as compared to non-victims. Three characteristics that increase potential for victimization are first, target vulnerability, where the victim is less likely to resist, target graphiability, where the victim has something of value, and target antagonism, where the victim possesses characteristics that arouse anger or jealousy. When it comes to elderly victims, older adults face risks of financial, physical, and psychological abuse. These abuses often go unreported as much as 31% of the time, and family members are often the perpetrators 76% of the time. A rapidly increasing elderly population in the United States has the potential for increased frequency of abuse incidents. When it comes to victims and their criminals, most crimes are committed by a single offender over the age of 20. Crimes tend to be interracial. A surprising number of crimes are committed by relatives or acquaintances of the victim. Most crimes are committed by single offenders over the age of 20. And a surprising number of violent crimes are committed not just by acquaintances, but relatives themselves. Here's another activity for you. What are some of the reasons for why males are more likely to be victimized by a stranger and females are more likely to be victimized by someone they know? There is the victim precipitation theory, wherein victims initiate victimization. Active precipitation occurs when a victim uses threats or fighting words or attacks first. Passive precipitation occurs when victims have a characteristic that threatens or encourages the attacker. Then there are lifestyle theories. The victim's lifestyle choices led to victimization, or at least that's how the theory goes. But there are high-risk lifestyles, such as staying out at late, drinking alcohol, taking drugs, living on the streets, or being away or staying away from home, and associating with delinquent peers or a gang. The college lifestyle has high levels of partying and taking recreational drugs. Most victims of sexual assaults are acquainted with their attackers, just to remind you. Then there's the criminal lifestyle. Criminals are much more likely to be victimized than non-criminals. Drug dealers who become crime victims tend to break away from crime. Then there's the deviant place theory. Victims reside in socially disorganized high crime areas. The focus is on neighborhood crime levels, not individual characteristics or lifestyle, and there are sometimes honor codes that are in place. Then there's the routine activities theory. Three characteristics are needed for crime to occur. A suitable target, something of value, an absence of capable guardians or things or people that deter crime from happening, and a motivated offender. Crime in everyday life occurs and research supports this theory. Routine activities and lifestyle can include both theories that share four characteristics, proximity to criminals, time of exposure to criminals, target attractiveness, and guardianship. There are five predictions of victimization from these two theories that include living in a high crime area, 
going out late at night, carrying valuables, engaging in risky behavior, or going out without friends or family. You can see in this chart where these theories of victimization come together and where they merge, you find a darker area that unfortunately leads to crime. Helping victims cope is responsibility of all society. There's the Omnibus Victim and Protection Act, as well as the Comprehensive Crime Control Act, Victims of Crime Act, and Crime Victims Rights Acts. These all provide victim service programs, such as victim compensation for medical bills, loss of wages, loss of future earnings, counseling, and burial costs. Awards typically range from $100 to $15,000 and there are victim advocates. There's also, through these programs, the assignment of counselors to crime victims and assignment of court advocates to prepare victims for court procedures. Then there are victim impact statements, where the victim is allowed to make a statement before a sentencing judge. Some research shows this leads to higher incarceration rates. Other research shows no impact. Public education plays a role where the public is educated about victim services like prevention programs and school-based programs. And crisis intervention helps because there's a referral of victims to a local network of social service agencies. There's a Good Samaritan program in the state of Alabama whose services include home repair after a burglary, home safety inspections, accompanying victims to court, and providing victim care kits. Then there's the Victim Offender Reconciliation program. This seeks to bring the victim and the offender together to lead to restitution and to help repair relationships. There's also victim notification where the state must notify a victim or potential victim of offenders locations. The victim information and notification every day or VINE which is a national computer database and the Victim Notification System, or VNS, which is also a national database. There's legal protection for victims as well. Protective orders which require accused abusers to immediately stop stalking or harassing a victim and to stay away from the victim's home. Now, victims have a Bill of Rights in every state as well. And these rights include to be notified of proceedings and the status of the defendant, to be present at criminal justice proceedings, to make a statement at sentencing and to receive restitution from a convicted offender, to be consulted before a case is dismissed or a plea agreement entered, the right to a speedy trial, and that's not just for the defendant, it's also for the victim, and to keep the victim's contact information confidential. There are also victim advocate groups who work for victims to help them with self-protection for use of firearms and help in just fighting back in general. Here's the last discussion activity for this particular chapter. Discuss the opportunities that victims have to participate in the criminal justice system. Should victims' rights be expanded? And if yes, what rights do you think victims should have? Class, thank you always for your time and attention. If you need any further help from your instructor, do not hesitate to contact them. Thank you again for your time, and we'll see you next class.